Thank you, Martin, and hi, everyone. My name is Katie, and the other person who's going to be speaking today is my colleague, Matthew. And I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you for being here with us. We're really, really excited to be here with you and bringing this talk to you, albeit remotely, but still great. And I just want to say thank you to the organizers for doing such an exceptional job in these crazy circumstances. I have absolutely loved the conference so far, and I hope you all have as well. So in terms of what we're going to be talking about today, we are going to be talking about getting a job in animal advocacy. And the reason we're going to be talking about this is that we've both had slightly different journeys to, uh, to getting here. And so we want to share those experiences with you and our top tips as a result of those experiences so that hopefully you too can get a job within the movement. And the first thing we would like to say on this is that we know it can be a very frustrating area to get a job in because there's so many people who are so passionate about this cause. And whilst that is absolutely fantastic for the animals, that's great news for them. There's all these people clamoring to, uh, to help them. It does mean that it can often be frustrating and sometimes confusing to try and get a job in this area. Um, that said, we hope that you'll leave this talk today feeling inspired and hopeful to get going on your very own journey or to keep that job search going if you're already underway. So in terms of what we're going to cover today, in the first half of the talk, we're going to give you a bit of an introduction to the Humane League UK, first of all, or THL UK, as I will inevitably refer to it at some stage, which is the organisation that obviously me and Matthew both work for. And uh, we're going to talk like about who we are as an organization and things like that and just give you a bit of an introduction there. And then we're going to give you an introduction to us and who we are and our roles at the Humane League and also our own stories and how we ended up uh, working where we are today. And then in the second half of the talk, we're going to dive into our five top tips and of course, Hopefully, presuming that we don't ramble on too long, there will also be plenty of time for questions at the end. So at that point, I will hand over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Katie, and hi, everyone. I uh, hope you're all enjoying the conference so far. And again, I echo a big thank you to the organisers. Um, it's been really enjoyable so far and appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, so yeah, just to give you an overview, a quick uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Humane League, uh, here's a quick brief history. Uh, so we are an international not-for-profit animal protection organization and we started off in the US in 2005 and we've since expanded with offices now in Japan, Mexico and the UK uh, where myself and, and Katie both work and we've been operating here since 2016. And in that same year after realizing that we couldn't and indeed shouldn't do this work on our own we founded the Open Wing Alliance uh, bringing together similar groups from around the world, sharing knowledge, expertise and strategies. And this powerful coalition now consists of more than 80 organisations spread well over 60, over 60 countries and across six continents, all working together for the animals. And here at THL, um, our mission statement is clear. We exist to end the abuse of animals raised for food. The way that we do that, certainly in the UK office, is through the dedicated teamwork of our different departments that make up THL. From the finance and operations team, through to donor development, to our comms team, all of which are integral to the smooth operation of the, of the organisation. And demonstrate the many areas in which you could explore working. I sit within the corporate relations team, uh, whilst Katie is in the campaigns department. So what I'll do now, pass you, pass you back to Katie and she'll tell you a bit more about her role and her journey to the movement. Thanks, Matthew. So yeah, just a bit of an introduction to, uh, to me. So as Matthew said, we're part of the UK team. So I'm based in the UK. I'm based in Northamptonshire, the middle bottom-ish bit of the country, I guess. So I am the national volunteer coordinator for the Humane League. And this is my very first job in animal advocacy and I've been doing it since February last year so roughly one and a half years now and 
here at THL UK, our network of volunteers is quite unique. It's made up of people from all over the country. And as a result, we have this wonderful network of activists who support us from wherever they are based across the UK. And I can see a few of their lovely names uh, joining us live today as well. So that's great to see you. And in terms of what I do in, in my job, uh, I basically help to organize and coordinate all of these, all of these wonderful people. So I recruit and train and generally support our volunteers, just making sure that they have everything that they need to go out and be that super amazing force for animals that they are. And due to the nature of the network being remote, obviously this involves a lot of video calls with the volunteers, a huge amount of emails, huge amount of emails, uh, a lot of coordination and resources and designing of training and guidance documents and things like that. So everyone has everything that they need. And because we want to also make sure that our volunteers have, you know, interesting projects to get involved with. I also like to make sure that our staff are connected with the right volunteers to support them with any uh, tasks that they, they need help with. So there's a lot of coordination from that side as well, matching up the right people to the right project. And as Matthew said, I'm part of the campaigns department. So I also work really, really closely with them in particular because a huge amount of what our volunteers are involved with is campaign centered. So there's also a lot of work there just making sure that we can mobilize our volunteer team to be the real people power behind our campaigns. So overall, the job really involves a lot of um, inspiring passion in other people and convincing people to take action. Um, there's also a lot of organization and coordination because obviously we have these wonderful people all over the UK and there's only one of me. So just making sure that, you know, everyone has everything that they need. And of course, there's also a real big element of training and mentoring and supporting the volunteers, which I personally love. It's one of the things that I really adore about this job. And uh, as I said before, because everyone is remotely based around the UK, there's also a huge amount of digital communications as well. So overall, it is a job that is definitely different every day. It is often very reactive. So it can be very challenging because things are changing all the time. But it's a really, really rewarding role and definitely something to consider doing if you enjoy working with people. So that's broadly what I do in my job. And now I'm going to talk about my journey to, uh, to getting here. So my journey into the movement was, uh, was quite a long one. There was definitely a lot of frustration involved along the way. And that's because ever since I can remember, I have always loved animals, probably very similar to all of you in this virtual room. And so I knew that no matter what I did with my life, I wanted to end up in a place where I could work in a job to help them in some way. And I didn't really mind what that was. And that initially led me to studying zoology at university, which was great. And then I went on to do a master's in animal conservation and sustainability as well. But as I was just finishing my master's, I went vegan. So I was kind of going through that transition phase. And as a result, my ideal job really switched from wanting to work to help animals more broadly to wanting to work within farm animal advocacy more specifically. And that is um, definitely when, when the fun started for me. So, uh, so I finished university and once I'd finished that, obviously the job search began. But with my lack of specific experience in that particular field, I was unable to find anything that was really suitable. And dis despite applying to lots of different places, I didn't hear anything, anything back. Um, that wasn't a huge surprise at that point. You know, like I say, I didn't have a huge amount of, of relevant experience as yet. So I thought, you know, what I'll do is I'll work in the environmental field for a bit where I arguably had a bit more skills and a bit more expertise. And I just thought I'll build as much transferable skills as I can in that area and I'll bring it back and hopefully be able to transition back into farm animal advocacy work. And that's essentially um, what happened. So my first job after leaving university was actually um, going back to university again. I was working in a student's union and that job basically involved organizing a lot of student volunteers 
So as you can see in this image here, it was a lot of helping them design campaigns and protests and events and things like that. So uh, it was great. It was a fantastic job. I, I absolutely loved it. And I was even able to sneak my vegan message in where possible. Like you can see on this image here, we've got the um, a snapshot from our Meat Free Mondays campaign. And I did that job for, for two years. And after doing it for two years, I went back again, tried to really, you know, start applying for jobs back in farm animal advocacy. And I still wasn't getting anywhere. I still wasn't even getting any replies. So I was a bit stuck because my two year contract was ending. I needed something. So again, I thought I'll stay in the environmental field. And I was offered a role doing something very similar involving student volunteer coordination again, but at a much bigger scale. So not just at one university, but across like a large portion of, of the UK. Uh, so uh, yeah, I thought I'll do that for a few years, I'll see how that goes, maybe a year, maybe two. And I ended up doing that job for three years, which was slightly longer than I was expecting. And during most of those years, obviously I was still desperately trying to get a job in animal advocacy. And I was applying for loads of different things and really trying to boost my skills in my spare time as well and get lots of voluntary experience and things like that, which I'll talk about a bit later on. But as time went on, I wasn't getting anywhere. And obviously by this point, I'd been looking for around five years now. And I'm sure many people appreciate the frustrations that go into applying for all these jobs and preparing the CVs and the cover letters and all the skills tests and all that kind of stuff to often not hear anything back. So I was just confused at this point. I thought I finally had relevant experience. I'd got all of this stuff that I've been doing and I still wasn't getting anywhere. So I made a bit of a promise to myself that was, unless I see something absolutely perfect come out of the ether, I am going to stop applying for jobs. And about three months after I made that promise to myself, this job that I'm in became available. And I remember reading it and just thinking, wow, this is everything. I would be genuinely passionate about this job. I know I have the skills to do this job well. And I was actually terrified of applying to it because of all the previous knockbacks and how difficult it had been, you know, not getting anywhere before. And I thought, if I don't get this job, I really don't know where I'll go from there because I knew that this was absolutely perfect. So I stared at it for a few days and spoiler alert, I obviously applied to the job and I was very, very, very lucky to, um, to get this job. And I'm just so, so glad that I didn't let those previous knockbacks stop me. So that was my personal journey into the movement. So now back over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Katie. Uh, hello again, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Matthew. Um, bit of background, I live in Reading in the UK. Um, just to help you place it, it's about 40 miles or 65 kilometres west of London. Uh, I'm the UK Corporate Relations Coordinator here at the Humane League, and I've been doing this job since the start of 2019. I joined it around the same time as Katie. Uh, so my, my role here involves me talking to food companies of all sizes and across all sectors, so ranging from retailers, supermarkets, to food service companies, through to restaurant chains, producers and manufacturers. Basically telling them who we are, what we are working on, and why they should be adopting the, the welfare measures that we are asking them to. Um, and since joining the Humane League, the focus of my work has predominantly been getting companies to adopt a better chicken commitment. Um, but it also includes an element of fulfilment and accountability work uh, in relation to cage-free egg commitments that were made a few years ago that are due to come into force now. So the job itself um, includes a lot of looking at different sectors in the, in the food, um, food arena, working on strategies, focusing on projects, uh, researching companies, finding out the right contacts and people to speak to, uh, understanding the nature of relationships between food companies and their supply chains. So I spend a lot of time crafting emails, sort of building a story to engage with companies, I guess the first challenge is really um, to open up the conversation to get that dialogue going. So luckily, I've always enjoyed a challenge um, and I'm pretty good, um, hopefully, at talking to people and building relationships. And I think to do all of this, knowing that my work will have a positive impact and go towards improving the lives of chickens um, is, is extremely rewarding. 
So moving on to my journey into the movement, it's somewhat different to that of Katie's. Um, believe it or not, uh, my working life began way back in the summer of 1996, uh, having left school at uh, the tender age of 16. Always enjoyed learning, but I was never much of a studier, so it never really worked for me. And I was always keen to get out and start sort of earning, earning money. Um, uh, apart from a paper round, the only other job I'd had was two months working in McDonald's, uh, which we won't go into any further. Uh, so through family connections, I, um, I landed a, an engineering apprenticeship, which I lasted in about a year and decided it wasn't for me. At this point, I had no clue what I wanted to do with, with my sort of career uh, and took a job um, in an insurance office. A friend of mine worked there. He said, oh, it's great. And then he left after two weeks, never saw him again. And then I spent the next sort of 20 plus years working in a variety of roles in the insurance industry, um, including helping to start up a new insurance broking business where I was the commercial manager. And a big proportion of our clients were actually fast food franchisees, including the largest KFC franchisee in the UK. Um, the insurance industry is no doubt important and it gave me a good living, but ultimately it's not the most exciting or indeed fulfilling. Um, at that point, where I was working, we were merged into a larger firm. I took a job there, wasn't really settling. And it was during that time in about 2012 that I went vegetarian. Um, but it wasn't until sort of 2015, sort of three years later, that I eventually became vegan, sort of following a path I'm sure many of you can relate to, watching documentaries, reading books, social media posts, that sort of thing. Uh, at this point, I changed jobs and I was working as a, an insurance broker. Um, won't bore you with the details, but essentially that was finding and arranging insurances for a variety of businesses from construction companies to technology firms and that sort of thing. And then it was in early 2017 when I started getting involved in, in activism with a local animal rights group um, and over time more involved in other projects, which I was really enjoying, uh, which I'll go into a bit more detail in, in a bit later in the talk. Um, and I started to think, how can I sort of perhaps scale this up and even look at seeking out a career? And then I guess it was sort of late summer 2018, after some planning, I sort of took the decision to, to leave my insurance broken job. Um, the place itself wasn't a great environment, so that contributed to that decision. And for me, that was the breathing space I really needed to think about what I wanted to do next. And it was clear to me at that point that I wouldn't get a job or career satisfaction from going back into insurance and spend some time thinking about what it is I really wanted to do. Um, so I would just add in that point, all of you in, perhaps in your 20s or indeed 30s or even 40s and you haven't decided on a career path yet, don't panic. I was, sort of, I was 38 at this point. And it was then I was thinking maybe I could find a career that was both rewarding but also help pay the bills because most of the time we've all got those to pay as well. And I came across a charity jobs website and started looking through the different sort of sections like human rights, environment, sort of homeless charities, animal rights. Um, and then I, one day I came across these three roles posted by the, the Humane League, which caught my attention. Um, and one of these was corporate relations coordinator. Um, reading the spec of that job, I remember feeling that I might be able to do this. I was looking at how I could uh, transfer the skills I'd acquired through my working life and how these could be applied to that role. I remember I didn't apply straight away. I must have come back to it a number of times over the space of about two or three weeks. Uh, and as the closing date for the applications was getting, getting nearer um, and I finally, with a bit of push, I finally went for it. And obviously I'm very glad that I did. Um, and that's a very sort of brief version of, of how I ended up here today. And which will move us on to our sort of first tip, as it were, of the presentation. Whilst we both had very different experiences to get here, one thing we definitely both had in common was the fact that we both did a lot of volunteering. Uh, and we want to delve a bit deeper into that now and how you can draw from those sort of voluntary actions and apply them to, to landing a job. Yes, so tip number one, so volunteering. So obviously as national volunteer coordinator, I might be slightly biased towards the joys of volunteering, but I definitely know from my personal experience that the time I spent doing different volunteering roles was really, really valuable. And I certainly would not be where I am today without that experience. 
So for me, I had really two types of volunteering experience, if you like, which was, first of all, stuff that I kind of invented myself. And second, the um, volunteering with more recognizable organizations. So starting with the first part of that, when I first went vegan, I lived in a tiny village in the middle of nowhere. I still do now. Um, and there wasn't really a local vegan group for me to get involved with. And as a result, I really had to design my own volunteering opportunities in order to gain a similar experience that would be offered in that setting. So I started to look locally to me and just figure out what I could potentially do. And the first thing that I did was start to do talks on veganism, uh, just in my local village hall, nothing fancy at all. I might have had two or three or maybe four people, if I was lucky, turning up to these talks. But it really was very meaningful for me because it pushed me massively out of my comfort zone. I was obviously newly vegan at that point. So just to start talking about why vegan, why it mattered, how you could do it and talk to normal folk about, about veganism was a really great experience just to answer those often difficult questions that you might get. So even though it was a very small scale, it was something that I could do in my spare time around my full-time job and it really was great experience. The second thing I did, uh, which was on a, on a similar scale, very local to me, was something that came about completely by accident and this was when I discovered a local factory farm for chickens was going to be built just a few miles down the road from me. And I thought, no way is that happening on my watch. So as you can see from this slide, the first thing that I did was I decided to um, basically launch a local campaign. So I did a change.org petition, very simple, just online. And then I ended up going door to door in my local area as well to try and gather support from, from everyone who could be affected by this. And this led to all cool, all kinds of like different um, experiences like speaking with the local media and even doing debates at my local council with all different kinds of stakeholders that were involved in this factory farm build and as a result I was really able to get fantastic experience from this and it was such a big learning curve and I wouldn't have had that chance if I hadn't have taken that opportunity when it presented itself so it was a really really um, great way to kind of test those campaigning muscles out if you like. So as I gathered this local based experience, I felt a bit more confident applying to more recognizable organizations just to see if they needed help with anything. And this could be uh, just, you know, emailing organizations and saying like, hey, these are my skills. Do you need anyone? I did a bit of that. And also looking out for specific roles being advertised. So things again, like Matthew mentioned before, like charity job and in the volunteering section, things like that. And being with these bigger organizations, it led to more organized, larger scale events. So things like leafleting and protests and things. But living where I did, I couldn't really get to these as often as I wanted to. It was something I couldn't fit in as easily around my full time job. So I ended up instead trying to support them in other ways. So, for example, um, a lot of online activism for them and supporting their campaigns remotely, which is also a really powerful tool that's often overlooked or not counted as volunteering when it really actually is and again this gave me a lot of different experience and it was just another string to my bow if you like so it definitely gave me more insight into uh, these organizations which I ultimately wanted to be working for. So overall I definitely say that if there isn't something immediately obvious in your area or around you that you can get involved with don't be afraid to start something yourself. It certainly helped me to boost my confidence and get different skills and experiences in this area. And at the same time, try not to be put off by what you think the ideal volunteering role looks like or what counts as volunteering, because the whole beauty of volunteering is that you can try loads of different stuff and you can get different diverse experiences and really kind of put the feelers out to work out what you want to be doing long term. So it's definitely worth uh, gathering as much experience as you can. And I know that I would not be in this job today without that volunteering experience. 
it's really helped to shape who I am as an activist, but also how I, how I do my job. So gaining as much volunteering experience as you can is definitely worthwhile and really, really helpful. Yeah, so I mean, volunteering for me, I wasn't someone who had um, previously done any voluntary work, to be honest. Um, but after going vegan and having attended uh, a number of vegan events, I started to get a nagging feeling that I really wanted to get involved and do some sort of activism and sort of try different things, see what, what would fit for me. So in early 2017, after watching from afar and sort of walking past um, a number of times, I joined a local animal rights group called uh, Reading Vegan Outreach uh, and would spend weekends doing outreach, protests, food tasting, leafleting, that sort of thing. Um, I was very much out of my comfort zone doing this. Um, and I remember, I mean, to give you a bit of background, was Katie was sort of living in a tiny village. I live in Reading, which is the UK, which I think in England is the, the largest town that's not a city. So population about 350,000 people. So very much out of my comfort zone. Um, I remember the first event I attended here, um, you'll see the picture with doing an Earthlings experience, some of you may be familiar with. Um, it proved very costly as I, uh, I dropped my iPad at the end of it and smashed the screen, um, but I had the bug to do more activism and also an expensive repair bill. So as I grew in confidence and as well knowledge through educating myself, sort of reading and learning more about, about veganism and about animal rights, I moved from handing out leaflets or holding signs to actively engaging with the public on the subject of, of veganism and the suffering of animals. And around the same time, I saw a Facebook post on a local vegan group about anyone interested in helping to organize a vegan festival in Reading. Uh, so I joined up and became one of the organizers, taking on the role of, of booking stallholders, so curating the part, that part of the festival. And through this voluntary role, um, I gained event organizing experience and also like the trials and tribulations, trying to get people to pay their invoices on time as well. And definitely one of the skills I picked up doing this was sort of understanding what would appeal to visitors and how we could put together a festival that would appeal to non-vegans, because ultimately that's why we were doing it as a, as a form of activism uh, to try and get people interested and engaged. Um, and the picture there is from our first event in 2017, where we had two and a half thousand people attend. So it was, a, it was a really successful event. And a learning from this, I would sort of want to share with, with everyone, um, that if you are doing voluntary work, um, even if it's on a small event or larger event, just is to take it seriously, do it properly and be professional. Uh, you don't always get it right, but people do, uh, will notice and will appreciate it. And certainly these collective experiences were really useful for me when approaching the role at the Humane League, um, as I was able to demonstrate that one, I didn't sort of shy away from difficult conversations with the, like the public outreach side of things. Um, and also I had a drive to contribute to positive change of the festival. So um, both of these were sort of vital elements uh, to the role I, I do now. And which now moves us on to our top, uh, top Tip number two, about be yourself. So over to Katie. It's hard to say. Top tip number two. Um, so yeah, so uh, tip number two, be yourself. And this might sound uh, cheesy, but it is definitely true. So for me, being myself was all about starting uh, with my CV and actually being open on that document with what I did in my spare time and what I did with the very dreaded personal interests section where we all feel an immense pressure to be some kind of superhuman and work 20 full-time jobs and look after 14 charities in our spare time and you know all this crazy stuff and if that's you that's great but often this isn't really realistic but this section of your cv is a great chance to add some personality and really make you stand out so for me actually saying you know i like walking and being outside and most of my time is spent looking after my house filled with rescue animals that's basically what i do you know it adds a bit of personality and another layer to an otherwise very 2d document which is all the employers get to see of you, at least initially. So it's a great chance to just add a bit of sparkle in that section. 
And the other thing I did uh, on, on my CV was actually pick out and highlight things that I'd enjoyed from previous jobs or things that I was particularly proud of, because again, it really helps to add your unique person personality and the experiences that you've had, and it makes you stand out a bit more in those initial stages. Uh, the other thing that I did that I found very, very useful after reading an article on this was actually creating a list of what my ideal job would look like. And at the same time, write a list of things that I was good at and what I actually enjoyed doing. And this, I appreciate, sounds a bit random and pointless, but it actually isn't easy to do at all if you do it properly. You have to really be honest with yourself about what you actually want to do, not what you think you want to do, and also what you genuinely enjoy as well. So it takes some time to untangle that. But a great part of this exercise was actually looking to the people who know you best, like friends and family and colleagues, and actually asking them, what do you think I'm good at? or what are the parts of my personality that you think are really good qualities? Because the things that are often invisible to us that we take for granted as not even anything might actually be remarkable standout qualities to the people who know you best. And it really gives you a chance to pick out these skills that you didn't even know that you had. And all of this combines just helps you kind of figure out what job you want rather than trying to shape and mold yourself to every role that you happen to see which is certainly what i was doing and of course i'm not saying that you then have to hold out for the absolutely most perfect job ever that hits all the 10 things on your list but it does give you a bit of an idea of where you might want to head and how you can potentially take the steps to get there so it's definitely worth doing and then the third uh, piece of advice on this tip is perhaps the most difficult, which is trying to actually be yourself at interview stage. And obviously this is easier said than done. And for me personally, it definitely was practice makes perfect. There was a lot of fake interview scenarios that my friends and family were um, that had to do for me they uh, loved me for that but eventually it's definitely a great thing to practice because you can just say this is me this is what i've done this is what i'm good at and if you are a right fit for that organization they will see that because often when we're not ourselves at interview level we're hiding some of our standout amazing qualities that that organization could actually be looking for so you're actually doing yourself a disservice and the organization that you're interviewing for so really try to show up as best you can as you in a professional way obviously because you're much more likely to shine and hopefully much more likely to get the job as well so uh that brings us on to tip number three don't compare your experiences to others thanks katie yeah um i think this is a this is a really uh, important one to look at and something I definitely found myself doing um, when I was searching for a role and, and indeed even when preparing for interviews, having researched the interviewer, I found myself sort of not only comparing myself to people already working within the movement, but also uh, an imagined version of these people as well, um, based on the fact that I, I'd never worked in the movement before, I don't have a degree, I don't have the qualifications seemingly everyone else seemed to have. Um, it was certainly for me an element of imposter syndrome like this this slide picks out um and people having more sort of experience and, and definitely on the qualifications but it's important to remember that i think all experiences is is, are, is good experience and this can certainly help you define where you personally want to go in the movement uh, for example on the surface of it my insurance career may not appear to be linked at all to this field but I can't now imagine doing this role without all of that experience that I built up. Now, it doesn't mean you need to go and work 20 years in the insurance industry. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. But for all of those, the meetings, the researching companies, the negotiations, the difficult conversations, the understanding of different business sectors, that's all experience that I've been able to bring to this role and apply that to what I'm doing now. And just, and don't look to others and think you must be on the same path as them uh, and, and don't compare yourself to what can be very intimidating looking 
high achieving individuals. Um, there's a lot of passionate people in the movement from a variety of backgrounds and experiences. I mean, just look at us two and our sort of journeys to the movement are very different. Um, you have experience and skills that are unique to you and they will be valuable and important to the movement. And so now this brings us along to top tip number four, uh, know your subject. And Katie's gonna guide us through the first part of this. I'll do my best to guide us, guide us through this bit. Um, yeah, so uh, knowing your subject was definitely really important for me and something really beneficial because if you want to work in the movement, it's really good to know the movement or at least, you know, as best you can because as we know, it's always, always changing. So it's great to just keep on top of what's going on. So dedicating regular time to kind of figuring out what's happening and who's running what campaigns and which organizations are doing what, or even the latest vegan product is really, really useful knowledge to have. And for me, what I used to do was I used to have um, dedicated time on Twitter, just kind of scrolling through, reading articles, see who was sharing what and figuring out what my favorite organizations were up to and, and what they were doing. And it was also a great way to find out about events like today's event where you could actually show up and learn more about what was going on, even though you weren't yet working within, within that field. Um, that's particularly true now. You know, a lot of these events like today's event are online. So they're often cheaper and easier to get to because you can usually just do them from from where you are. So it's a really great opportunity right now to just exploit that and really bolster your training and um, your knowledge as much as you can uh, about the animal movement. And uh, you never know, you might get to meet your hero like I did in this image here, which may or may not be in a frame on my wall. It's not. Um, but uh, this is Dr. Grieger, just in case anyone doesn't know who this is. And this is my absolute hero. Uh, so if you go along to these events, you um, might get to meet your hero at the same time as boosting your knowledge on the animal movement as well. And the other thing I'd say on this point is it's really useful to sign up to any newsletters or update emails that organizations offer because you're often first to know of events where they might be speaking or attending and it's a great way to be first to know about job openings as well so if you're kept up to date with that it's just a really great way to know what's going on in an organization that you want to work for and it also stands you in good stead if you end up interviewing for them because you have that kind of inside knowledge of of what they've been doing and all of this experience for me was really, really useful because when I came into this job, I didn't feel as much like I was working in this strange, unknown place. I'd at least seen some of these people's names before, whether they were speaking at an event or I might have seen them share something on Twitter or something. So it didn't feel like I had just landed on a strange planet. It felt like I had some background baseline knowledge and some kind of... Um, opening lines that I could talk to with that person about and it also really helped me in my interview for this job so it's definitely worthwhile uh, knowing your subject as best as you can. And so for me uh, the other side of knowing your subject is for me when researching the organisation I was going to apply to and looking at the people who are currently working there be careful not to compare yourself to them too much though. I remember spending quite a bit of time looking through the Humane League website, uh, reading articles, reading blogs, and then looking for other articles about the organisation and its values. It's important to really get a good understanding of an organisation you're going to apply to, um, as that will help you decide if it's one you actually want to work for. Uh, and also, if you know people already working within the, the movement, then reach out to them. They are often very happy to talk about their experiences. I remember when I was searching, I had two friends um, working animal protection groups uh, and getting their view on things was extremely useful. One was working for a charity um, and despite them having a, a noble cause, were really poorly run and operated and she had suffered in that role and eventually left, which is if you put all that effort in, you don't want to have that experience. Uh, but the other uh, really enjoyed her role and is still there today fighting for the animals. What I would say is you won't be expected to know everything about an organisation, but the more prepared you are, uh, the better place you will be to ask some great questions when you land that 
interview. Um, I can certainly say for me and my experiences, doing that bit of research, having that knowledge, having some tips to pull out and sort of talk about in the interview and subsequent conversations was really, really useful. You have 10 minutes left. Thank you. And that moves us on to our final tip of the talk. Tip number five, don't give up. Well timed. Um, yeah, so the fifth and perhaps the most important tip of all is don't give up. Both me and Matthew very nearly didn't apply for these jobs that we're currently in because we really let that kind of tiny voice in the back of our mind get to us. The kind of like, why would they want me voice? And particularly for me, because I've been trying for so long to get into the movement, I basically lost hope. And the thought that I would have missed out on this opportunity if I hadn't have got over that fear is just like terrible. So, um, you know, it's, it's really important to keep pushing on because the right role may not be now it might not be in three months time but it is out there somewhere so keep going and in the meantime keep learning and keep taking chances because the animals need you so yeah really to summarize and recap our top tips number one being volunteering uh, really push yourself out of your comfort zone to try new things Neither of us would be where we are without these uh, voluntary experiences. Be yourself, be confident to bring your authentic self to the job. Your unique experiences and personality is what will make you a great advocate for the animals. Don't compare yourself to others. And whilst say we can all easily fall into this trap, try and fight that temptation. You are you for a reason. And know your subject, research, stay on top of the news, look into those top organizations, educate yourself, network like these fantastic events like this one meet new people you may end up working alongside in the future and finally can't stress it enough as we've just said don't give up we know it can be hard uh, but keep going and you will find that role Yes, and just before we move into questions, just a quick reminder that all of you are already amazing advocates for the animals and you don't necessarily need to work in the movement to make a difference. So whether you're a volunteer or you're a donor or whatever you do, you know, the animals are already really, really lucky to have you. And I just wanted to uh, reiterate that. Certainly for us at THL, you know, we wouldn't be where we are without our incredible volunteers. Okay, so now I'm going to move into questions. Just a reminder, there is two of us. So if you want um, one of us specifically to answer your question, just chuck our name at the beginning. And if not, then you can just leave it open. And anything we don't have a chance to cover, we'll have our emails and stuff at the end. So do feel free to message us um, at any time. Thank you, Katie, and thank you, Matthew. Uh, to all other, to the rest of you, uh, please remember to post your questions to Slido. There are already some questions uh, uh, posted, and we will get right to them. And also, you can vote for the questions you find most interesting. So let's get to the first one. Uh, do you have any recommendations for individuals who are highly time constrained? Uh, that means, uh, what are the best alternatives to volunteering? Uh, I think for me on this one, uh, one thing I didn't mention is I had my own website, which is like a free web service. And that was a great way to kind of show that I had passion for the movement. And it was something that didn't necessarily take a huge amount of time every single day or every single week. It was just something that I obviously had to put in some time initially to set up. And then um, it just kind of ran itself. So I would post kind of um, vegan recipes on there or campaigns and things that I was supporting. So that might be a way around it. But it is really, really difficult to balance this alongside uh, full-time jobs and, and other commitments. Um, so I just try to bring things in as flexibly as you can around, around your work. Okay, thank you. Another question, what advice, uh, what advice uh, would you give to someone who does not enjoy very much working with people, an introvert, uh, but would like to work in animal rights field? I would say that there's still like loads of things that that you can do definitely with um, online activism, for example, as I mentioned before, you can do that from wherever you're based and it doesn't necessarily involve that direct interaction, which you might not be comfortable, comfortable doing. 
and also in terms of like knowing your subject and things just reading around the topic so there's loads of books that I can recommend to you that um, would not involve having to go to like a physical event to do that um, but also right now having all these events as, as remote uh, as remote events is a great opportunity to do that without you know necessarily worrying about that interaction side of things I don't know Matthew if you've got anything else to um, add on to add on to that yeah um I would also say because both our roles are very much uh, oriented around sort of engaging with people in my case sort of companies and in Katie's case with volunteers but as I pointed out like the start of the talk there are a lot of roles within organizations that aren't sort of people facing as such more, more background um, uh, like research roles or elements like that so yeah there's definitely there will definitely be um, areas around that you can sort of look at and I think Katie's covered those off really well there. Thank you. Uh, this is partially comment and partially a question uh, from uh, Siobhan. Not sure if I pronounced it correctly. Hi, enjoying the talk uh, so far and thanks for mentioning imposter syndrome, which is very real. My question, when will the THL fellowship program open? So we have a fellowship program in the US. So I'm not sure where you're based, Siobhan, but we have that there. Um, in the UK, we don't have that yet, but we do um, offer voluntary internship, more like internship type roles. Uh, so if you wanted to get in touch with me, we can absolutely um, chat about that if you're interested. Okay, thank you. Uh... Hi, do you guys, uh, hi guys, do you have any volunteers working remotely outside the UK for you? We do, only a handful, there's probably four or five that I can think of off the top of my head, so it is, it is possible. It depends kind of what you want to do volunteering wise, so those people that I can think of uh, tend to help with our corporate relations research, so it's things that they can chip away at um, from wherever they're based, um, and also some people that do some translations stuff for us, again with corporate relations, so uh, we do have people that um, are not based in the UK that are part of our volunteering programme. Thank you. Uh, this is interesting one. What is your advice to people with no university degree? Would it be more useful to go study something or is volunteer experience uh, good enough to get the job? I'll probably take, I'll probably take this one as um, I say, I've, I didn't uh, go on to any uh, level of sort of higher education. So I have always enjoyed learning stuff, but like the structured environment was never really mine. Um, so for me, it was like getting that work experience um but think of it now i think there's there's so many um courses available like online courses and so many of those are free now i've found some like, really interesting ones around chicken welfare that i think it was coursera or something like that um so build up some knowledge and information that way get into volunteering i can't really comment if you if it make a difference you go and go off and study it and get a degree in something but it brings you back to that build on the experience, build on the experiences that you have now uh, and really sort of hone in on where it is you want to work. And if it, if it would aid you to get that role, then maybe do some, some shorter courses uh, and build up your, your CV in that way. But don't ever see that as something that could potentially hold you back because I don't think it should be. And I would also say to organisations and, and people looking to hire, uh, don't always just look at qualifications um, because it is a two-dimensional document and that, that doesn't encapsulate what that person can bring to an organization. Okay, we are running out of time, but if you can answer this one quickly, we can make one last question. Uh, what do you recommend to someone who wants to work in the movement, but is from a country where animal rights movement uh, does not exist or is hugely marginalized? That's really, really difficult. And it's a massive, massive challenge. So there's no kind of like easy way of, of doing that. But you can imagine that if you feel that way, there's going to be other people somewhere in the country that also feel the same. So it might well be that you can find something that you could locally organize or start yourself. And it's, it's worth a shot, I guess, but it really depends on, on what country, because obviously I know that a lot of it can be um, 
dangerous to do this kind of thing so it depends but um yeah hopefully you could start up something and get more people just like you that are passionate but also can't find an outlet for that passion so it's worth trying to start something and, and organize i don't know matthew if you've got any other points to yeah just a quick one i would say just um if there isn't a, an open wing alliance organization in the country that you're in but perhaps reach out directly to the open wing alliance who may be able to give you some guidance Okay, thank you very much. We are out of time. Uh, thank you, Katie and Matthew, for your presentation and for the answer for the questions. Uh, there are some more questions in Slido, uh, but sadly we cannot go through them.